Uh, in addition to my work at Intermountain Healthcare, I was full-time faculty here at the U for about 15 years before I transitioned over to be the Director of Outcomes Research actually at, at Intermountain and just recently in the last six months transitioned into a new role as the uh, Medical Director for Community Health. And um, I'm also a adjunct professor in family and preventive medicine in the Division of Public Health. So I still have strong ties to the university. And um, I love this topic, uh, you know, don't hibernate, rejuvenate. And as I was putting my slides together, I thought, well, rejuvenation is about so much more, you know, than just physical activity. You know, it's, it can be about, you know, mind and body. And, you know, when I think about rejuvenation, too, I'm thinking about, you know, getting a massage. I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, we're going to kind of limit our uh, discussion to um, physical activity during the winter months and really being able to stay active during the winter season. So I retitled this to, um, I'm hoping to retitle this to uh, Don't Hibernate, Activate. So um, let's just start with you know, something that I think we're all pretty familiar with, and, um, and that has to do with the weather. Uh, we're not going to talk so much about the climate today, um, but uh, you know, this is a, a graph that I, um, I uh, absconded uh, from uh, a Google image. And it really kind of shows, you know, our precipitation, which is the green bars there um, throughout the year. It looks at our uh, maximum and minimum temperature. And, you know, not surprisingly, you know, we have, you know, more precipitation actually kind of late winter into early spring. You know, March, April, and May are our wettest months. Uh, but certainly the uh, dark blue line is our minimum temperature and the pink, the bright pink line is our average temperature you know, during the year and, you know, definitely, you know, in kind of the, you know, November, December, kind of towards the end of the year and now in the start of the year, January, February and March are our coldest months. And, you know, when it's cold and snowy, um, you know, t people tend to be hibernators. You know, they, if you don't love the outdoors, you know, that's when you spend time indoors. And, um, you know, so much so that, you know, I'll tell you that, you know, there's almost any cartoon available, you know, that talks about, um, you know, how people just kind of want to, you know, hunker down and, and cuddle up with their favorite um, blanket and uh, spend the winter indoors. But um, what I'm here to do today is to tell you that, A, it's really a bad idea. And when I share some of these health, you know, and physiologic changes that occur kind of in the setting of human hibernation, um, and uh, as well as share some strategies for how we can remain active, either outdoors or indoors. Um, I'm hoping that you'll leave here with, um, you know, a change in your knowledge and your attitudes and your beliefs and ultimately your behaviors and maybe help you overcome some barriers. So let's start out with kind of the physiologic effect of human hibernation. And, you know, I was aware of some of these, but I was a little stunned, I must admit, by you know the the gravity of these changes and how quickly some of these changes occur, you know when we are inactive or or underactive. So, um, when you have a complete cessation or it, you you stop your exercise training, you know your aerobic capacity, which we refer to as VO2 max, um, and your plasma volume you know, they decrease significantly within just two weeks. Within just two weeks, you start to see changes in your aerobic capacity and your blood volume. Your, your VO2 max or your aerobic, maximum aerobic capacity, it declines by 15% in 10 days and by 27% in 21 days. And some of these studies were done in um, prolonged bed rest. And these prolonged bed rest studies were actually done back in the 1980s. 70s and 80s, and um, some of them were done to try and get a better sense of what would happen to astronauts who were in anti-gravity situations, um, trying to understand kind of the physiology of, of, of space travel. And they um, recruited college students, I think some medical students as well, you know, to undergo these complete bed rest studies. And then they studied them and they looked at their cardiovascular physiology as well as, as other aspects of um, physiology and health. So, but even within just a few days of bed rest, just a few days, um, you start to see other kind of metabolic changes. 
um, both uh, glucose intolerance as well as kind of a, a hyper-responsive um, insulin uh, response uh, occurs to a glucose load. Um, so you can imagine that, you know, when somebody is at, at bed rest, you know, for a prolonged period of time, you know, in combination with other factors, um, may also increase the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. You have a reduction in total energy expenditure. Um, you have negative nitrogen balance, which reflects a loss of muscle protein. So again, this is within days. Within days, you're starting to lose muscle mass. You have a negative calcium balance, which is a reflection of loss of bone mass. So within days, you're losing bone mass. And, um, and I already mentioned that, you know, you see a decrease in aerobic power um, and that it occurs in combination with this reduction in plasma volume. So, you know, your overall blood volume is reduced in terms of, you know, what's being circulated inside your body. And over uh, a little bit longer term, because, you know, the bears don't hibernate for just a couple days or even a couple weeks, you know, they hibernate for months. Um, within a month of bed rest, so again, this goes back to some of these prolonged bed rest studies, you see a 10 to 20% decrease in muscle cross-sectional area. So muscles are getting smaller and getting weaker. Um, and uh, you see up to a 21% decrease in muscle strength. So we see you know, changes in aerobic uh, capacity, maximum aerobic capacity, changes in metabolic health. Um, we see uh, decreases in um, a muscle size and muscle strength, as well as a decrease in uh, bone mineral density. So it doesn't sound so good. Hibernation doesn't sound so good, does it? <laughs> I mean, you know, the more we can you know, stay active um, and across our lifespan, let alone across a calendar year, um, will help to kind of prevent these. You know, we talk about the, you know, there's that classic saying that says, if you don't use it, you lose it. And it's really true, and I, I will tell you that there's a wealth of scientific evidence to support that kind of cliched phrase of, if you don't use it, you lose it. So what can you do, you know, in the winter months? I mean, there's a lot that we can do. I mean, you know, we live in uh, the state, you know, that um, proclaims it has the greatest snow on earth. And so, uh, just a show of hands, how many of you actually take advantage of the outdoors and do snow activities? So about half. Yeah, and I'm, I'm from Minnesota, and uh, you know, it's, it's pretty snowy there. Not as snowy these days as it was when I was uh, growing up. Also super cold there. So I, I found that since moving to Utah, I actually do way more outdoor activities here because there's lots of snow and it's not as cold. So I've really appreciated um, the change in, in weather uh, moving from the Midwest to uh, Utah. And, um, and what are some of those things that you can do outside? Well, obviously skiing. You know, we have uh, you know, a multitude of uh, alpine skiing uh, resorts, some of the best in the world. And um, uh, certainly many people, both locally and, and far, far away, take advantage of that. Of course, you know, there's cross-country skiing in addition to alpine skiing. Um, and snowshoeing, you know, I had to like, you know, show off my kids a little bit. Um, but, you know, uh, you know your kids, uh, the greatest determinant of how active a kid is going to be is not surprisingly how active their parent is. You know, so if we really want to model, you know, good health across the lifespan, um, you know, we have to do it. Uh, and, you know, you have to not just talk the talk but walk the walk. And so my kids have been walking on snowshoes since, um, you know, they were walking. And um, what you see over on the lower right-hand uh, corner is, of course, some winter trail running. And I overlaid that with a picture of um, something that's called a microspike. I was going to bring a pair and show you, but in my rush to get out of the house this morning, I forgot them. But these are my favorite winter um, toy by far. And uh, whether I'm walking my dog or going trail running, um, I've even used them skiing, if I'm hiking skiing and I'm carrying my skis, um, is these just, these are rubber with these crampon-like chains on the bottom. They fit over any hiking shoe or running shoe um, or ski boot, as it turns out, and, um, and really gives you a good grip without having to go out and purchase 
you know, crampons and strapping those on or having special boots. Um, you can purchase them um, at, uh, at REI, that's where I got mine. I think you can buy them online, but they're called micro spikes. And, um, and what I have found is that using these is I have less fear of falling, you know, when I'm running or hiking in the winter. And I think that's one of the reasons, you know, when I said I hope this talk would, uh, you know, influence your knowledge, your attitudes, your beliefs, your behaviors, and help you overcome barriers. This is a tool to help overcome barriers. Because I think some people don't want to do outdoor exercise for fear of falling. And, um, you know, many years ago, the, the yak tracks came out. And they were also some rubber um, devices that could fit over your shoes that had some metal coils on them that um, were to help reduce slipping. But I'll tell you, these micro spikes um, are far superior, particularly on trails. So um, they've made uh, a really big difference for me, and, and I'm definitely way more active um, outside now that I have these. Um, and they're not quite as challenging to walk or run in um, than snowshoes. Obviously, you need snowshoes if you don't have a packed trail. These work particularly well on a packed trail, kind of like you see this runner in the lower right-hand corner, whereas the snowshoes are particularly good when you don't have a packed trail and you want to stay a little bit more on top of the snow. And nowadays, the snowshoes you know, are so incredibly accessible. Um, they're available not only to purchase. Um, I even have seen them at Costco. So you know, they're, they're not even cost prohibitive anymore. And they can be rented if you wanted to just give it a try. Um, I think you can probably rent them here through the Outdoor Recreation Program, as well as rent them at REI. And they're not expensive at all. And really, you know, what that allows you to do is, you know, to be active outdoors. And, um, and again, I'm all, about, I'm all about the family, you know, and all about being able to kind of be able to do it together, whether you're skiing together or hiking together, um, and really modeling that healthy behavior. And that, you know, just because it's snowy and cold out doesn't mean that you can't um, be active and be outdoors. And uh, I particularly liked this picture because it had Fido in the, in the background. And, uh, you know, um, having a, a partner, you know, for activity, whether we're talking about summer activity, spring, fall, winter, it doesn't really matter. But if you have a partner um, and somebody who is dependent on you, you know, then you're more likely to be physically active. And in fact, people who identify as dog walkers are more likely to um, meet recommended levels of physical activity. So I think, you know, having a dog is like, you know, truly is, can be your best friend, and particularly when it comes to physical activity. Um, the other thing that, you know, in talking about, you know, outdoor winter activity and, and just even walking, you know, as one of those um, strategies is it really aligns well with the Surgeon General's recent call to action on promoting walking in walkable communities. And Vivek Murthy is our current um, Surgeon General, and this is his very first call to action. It was called um, Step It Up. And, you know, and it's really saying that you know, walking is the way a majority of adults meet recommended levels of physical activity. And, you know, and how do we create um, policy, how do we create environments, you know, that support walking? Because people who, you know, are walking, whether they're doing it intentionally for fitness, or they're doing it to walk their dog, or they're doing it as part of active transportation, um, all of that counts. And um, Step It Up is, is really also in line with every step counts. And whether you're doing it for active transportation or you're doing it for fitness in a very deliberate manner, you know, or you're, um, you know, doing it, you know, just as part of your activities of daily living, it all counts. And so how do we facilitate that, you know, across our entire waking hours? Um, you know, walking to and from work, parking your car a little bit further away. What do you have to do in your office throughout the day in order to accumulate more steps? Um, what do you do in your active recreation time? And, um, and there's no reason why, even in the wintertime, particularly when you've got you know, tools, for example, like a yak track or a microspike that make outdoor activity even safer. So did you guys know it's our National Park, 100th Bur National Park Service Centennial this year in 2016? It's the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. And um, as part of this, uh, 
every fourth grader in the nation can get a free national park pass for the entire year. So if you have a fourth grader or you have a fourth grader, you know, grandchild, you know, uh, you can go online at the National Park Service. I should have put the URL up here. And um, you can uh, register and get a free National Park Pass for the entire year. Every fourth grader in the nation and his or her family is eligible for this. Now, you can see Zion. We had our um, 100th anniversary you know, a few years back in 2009. But I really kind of put this in here to say, don't forget about the parks. You know, and um, you know, we just got done with you know, the long President's Day weekend. And um, did any of you visit a national park over President's Day weekend? Where did you go? Arches. Arches. Was it spectacular? Absolutely. Yeah, it's so beautiful down there in the winter. I was going through my slide decks, and of course, you know, because I wanted to show all these kind of park pictures. This was President's Day weekend last year on the uh, right-hand side. And that would be me climbing up uh, some rocks, notably without a rope. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a little chilly. I've got my down puffy coat on. Um, but uh, there wasn't any snow down there. But it was February, you know, and we were down in just outside of Bryce Canyon. And, uh, and then you see my, my husband and son down there, you know, uh, posing for the picture. But I just wanted to kind of draw attention to the fact that, you know, we have, an, you know, it's an unbelievable playground. It's one of my favorite things about moving to Utah is actually southern Utah. Um, but particularly, you know, in those kind of um, shoulder seasons, you know, like late spring, late fall, into the winter. When we were down there, of course, you know, we're at Bryce Canyon, so you have to stay at Ruby's. And, um, you know, it was empty. And we had, we walked all over Bryce Canyon and then went down to the Slot Canyons and hiked around in there as well. But um, there's so much to do here. And I think sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, being creative and imaginative and thinking outside the box and saying, so what can I do, you know, aside from kind of the usual stuff, you know, hibernating inside and, and, and even if you don't like the snow, you know, there are places to go where you can explore you know, our beautiful state and not have to be outside. You know, certainly an advantage of uh, going to some place like southern Utah and some of our national parks is you get to escape the inversion. And this year has been bad, right? I mean, you know, I think our air quality index last week, you know, was in the 150s, which is, you know, un unhealthy for all. And you don't want to be outside exercising when the air quality is like this. I mean, you really don't. And particularly if you have health conditions like heart disease, stroke, asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or bronchitis, if you're pregnant, if, you're, if you have a young baby, if you've got five-month-old twins, you don't want them outside in this air quality. It's really bad for their health. It's bad for your health. It's bad for all of our health. So, you know, getting away, whether you go up into the mountains and you go hang out at one of the resorts or um, you go down south and go to one of our national parks, you know, it gives us an opportunity to escape the inversion. Um, I, uh, one of my responsibilities as medical director for community health is I co-chair our air quality and health initiative um, at Intermountain Healthcare. And um, we have developed a number of uh, patient fact sheets um, that are really aimed at educating people about the interaction and the relationship between air quality and health outcomes. So this is one of our patient fact sheets on air quality and outdoor exercise or work, you know, and it kind of talks about, um, you know, what are some symptoms that you might experience in the short term and in the long term as a result of exposure to poor air quality. And then it relates the air quality index or the AQI with some specific recommendations on, um, the, on physical activity and duration of physical activity in, in relationship to um, the AQI. Thought I'd just blow that up for you a little bit. Probably many of you do listen to NPR on your way to work and you hear the air quality report from Hawthorne Elementary. And um, Hawthorne Elementary is one of the monitoring stations in Salt Lake County. Um, it measures uh, our particulate matter levels, PM10 and PM2.5. It measures carbon monoxide, um, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxides, and it measures ozone. 
And, um, and so those numbers go into a formula that's um, been developed by the Environmental Protection Agency, and that um, determines that AQI number. And so a number of 1 to 50 is in the green zone, um, and that's considered good air quality. Between 51 and 100 is considered moderate. Um, and uh, when the air quality is moderate, you know, we recommend that people reduce their outdoor exercise, not as long, not as hard. Um, and certainly if you're having symptoms, you know, you ought to um, consider indoor activity. When it gets into the orange zone uh, or 101 to 150, that's considered unhealthy for sensitive groups. But some people with conditions like heart disease, asthma, um, probably should, you know, be limiting their activity even when they're in the moderate zone. Um, 151 to 200 is unhealthy for all. And we were in that last week. We were in the 150s. It's unhealthy for all. You know, and we really should be avoiding outdoor exercise when the AQI is in that range. And thankfully, I'm not aware since I've lived in Salt Lake that we've gotten into the, you know, greater than 200 range, you know, um, at all, if perhaps only a handful of times. But certainly there are other parts of the world where that's commonplace, sadly, like in Beijing. But you should be familiar with the AQI, and I'm, I'm really grateful for the work of UCARE um, and others that have done a really good job of working with our local media to, you know, to make sure that that air quality report is on the radio and on the television news in the morning. Intermountain is working on actually integrating it into our electronic health record, as well as putting it on our intranet so that we can start to make some you know, decisions about um, uh, you know, patient care at the point of care around um, air quality. So when the air quality is bad, you need some alternatives, you know, and, um, and even in the winter months, you know, there are lots of indoor um, exercise alternatives. You know, if you don't want to be outside or if it's not healthy or safe to be outside, you know, um, there are aerobic machines, you know, like treadmills and elliptical trainers, you know, that can be used. I'd encourage you to go over to the Eccles Library and use the walking treadmill desks. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, exercise classes, group exercise is a great way you know, for people to, to participate in activity, but also have it be social. You know, and it turns out that, you know, when we feel socially connected, you know, to, to someone, to a group, to a, you know, an exercise group leader, we are more likely to adhere and to attend. And that kind of goes back to my, you know, early comments, you know, about, you know, it's so important, you know, to, to stay consistent with exercises, to have a partner, you know, or a buddy, you know, whether that's a, a, a friend, you know, a colleague, a pet, all of the above. Um, I'll tell you that I, personally, I use all those strategies. And I'm into this, but I use them all. I meet a friend to exercise on Friday mornings at 6 in the morning. You know, um, I've got an 85-pound chocolate lab, you know, who insists on running uh, on a regular basis. And, um, and so, you know, we uh, uh, have a lot of fun you know, working out together. And um, another strategy would be uh, using things like um, uh, exercise videos. And I think we sometimes uh, forget those. And uh, they've gotten better and better and better. And the instruction is better and better and better. And so, you know, you don't need to have a gym membership, you know, in order to exercise um, uh, at home and to get a really intense uh, workout, and nor do you need to purchase a $3,000, you know, elliptical machine. You know, there are lots of ways for you to remain physically active, um, you know, again, throughout the winter months, even if you don't want to go outside. Now, Lisa knows I'm going to talk about this, and uh, some of you who may have been to a, a, a workshop that we did over at the Eccles Library in the fall, you know, may remember this. Did anybody, was anybody else there when I was talking about this? So I made everybody do it. <laughs> this is called the seven minute workout or the scientific seven minute workout as it's called. And um, it's based on some research that was done by an exercise physiologist up at, in Canada named Marty Kabbalah. And he uh, researches high intensity exercise. And, um, and he found that if you did you know, kind of short bursts of higher intensity exercise, you could actually have improvements in certain biometric markers like blood glucose levels and insulin levels and measures of, of cardiorespiratory fitness. And so some other exercise physiologists down in Florida now, they put together the seven minute workout. 
And this became popularized when Gretchen Reynolds, who is a reporter for the New York Times, did a story on it in the New York Times Magazine. And now there's all sorts of apps, you know, on the seven minute workout. And um, I did the seven minute workout this morning, twice. I do it every Wednesday morning. It's my other strength training workout. And um, so, you know, it, you can download the seven minute workout to either iPhone or Android. And, uh, and it looks like that. It's, you can see it right there. And then um, it's a series of 12 exercises, but one of them you do twice. So it's 13 exercises. It actually takes a little bit longer than seven minutes to do because you have 10 seconds of rest in between each exercise. And um, to do these exercises, you do not need any complicated equipment. As you notice, jumpy jacks require a floor, wall sit, a wall, step up onto chair, a chair. So that's it. No fancy equipment. You need floor, wall, chair. That's it. And then, of course, you need this handy dandy little app on your phone. Now, mind you, I was determined to do this this morning and I forgot my phone at work. So then I had to go and find a YouTube video on it because I wanted to do it this morning. But I love the gal's voice. You have to listen to this. Get ready for jumping jacks. Five, four, three, two, one, go. And so she's going to, you know, I'm going to do 30 seconds. Each exercise you do for 30 seconds. And I like her voice because all Americans have a fascination with all things British. 15 seconds left. And I love that she counts it down. <laughs> 10 seconds left. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Rest for 10 seconds. Get ready for wall sit. And so then she cues you for the next exercise. Five. So, uh, and then if I hit quit, she sends me a message that says, are you sure you want to quit, quitter? <laughs> yes, I quit. <laughs> I already did this twice today. So the scientific seven minute workout, I think, is just so accessible. You know, again, you know, if you don't want to wear spandex, don't. You know, I have colleagues at work who have this, you know, that they printed from the New York Times article, or you can just find it on Google Image. And they just printed it and they've got it, you know, uh, up in their cubicles, you know, or in their offices and are doing this. And um, because it's, you know, it's, uh, it's an easy thing to do. You can do it. Uh, and, and although they call it the seven minute workout, really to get the optimal benefits, you want to do it at least twice, two to three times, they say. So it, for me, it's my Wednesday exercise. And I really like the scientific seven minute workout. So, you know, and obviously that's a very self-directed program, which is great. You know, you don't need somebody kind of prodding you like with a cattle prod. But if you do need a little prodding, you know, um, you know, personal training, you know, is definitely an option. And, um, you know, a personal trainer can kind of help guide you through exercises that maybe you're just a little bit uncomfortable with, or, you know, there may be a fear of injury. Um, and uh, I just wanted to kind of point out, and I, I recommend this to my patients with some regularity, you know, if they're not comfortable doing things on their own, or they really want to have some accountability and to have somebody kind of coach and guide them, you know, through, say, a change in their um, physical activity or their exercise routine, is to consider an online personal trainer. And um, these are becoming very, very popular, and it's a subscription. And, um, and you know, what's nice about the online personal trainer is it goes where you go. You know, and for somebody who does a lot of business travel um, and they, they want to kind of continue to stay engaged in an exercise program as they travel, um, this is a great way to do it. It can be, um, it's done typically asynchronously. So it's not like that the, your coach or your trainer is online with you during the time you're training. Um, but there's a number of different uh, ways to access online personal training. And, um, and this is really easy. I, I googled online personal training and came up with these top 10 reviews. And these were the top 10 uh, personal training uh, uh, websites um, where you can develop an online fitness program that you can do at your own pace. 
You can, it's got a menu of services on many of these sites where you can say, I just want a workout program based on my goals, um, or I actually want to get more coaching. Um, uh, I want to see, in, there are videos of almost all the exercises. So that if you're not comfortable you know, doing one, you can actually watch a video, watch it as many times as you want. And um, it'll show you how to work through um, some of those exercises. So online personal training is another strategy you know, to help be, you stay active you know, uh, throughout the winter month without having it be um, a very uh, uh, expensive. So I really have, this is my last slide because I was hoping that, you know, this would really be kind of more of a discussion about, you know, what's working and, and I'm happy to kind of help people also work through their own barriers about being active uh, throughout the winter months. Um, but I think, you know, the main message is really about moving more. I mean, don't hibernate. You know, don't look at the winter as a time to kind of crawl into your, you know, your sweatpants, you know, and not sweat. And, um, uh, but, you know, in order to do that, I think you have to find something that you enjoy, you know, that's fun to do. And, uh, you know, is the seven minute workout like a ton of fun, fun for me? Well, I wouldn't say it's fun, but I enjoy the feeling of, of achievement, you know, and of having done it. And, um, and it makes me feel stronger. And, uh, and when I take my dog out, she's so happy. And I love meeting my friend at 6 o'clock in the morning on Fridays to, to work out together. It's a really social kind of way we connect with one another. And I'd say also think outside the box. You know, and, um, you know, if you don't like the snow, if you're not a snow person, you don't ski, you know, you, uh, maybe uh, snowshoeing or trail running, you know, doesn't appeal, you know, think about going to one of our national parks. Um, you know, down in southern Utah, you know, the sun shines most of the time. And, uh, and there's great things to do down there um, that are not very costly. Um, and you may need, you know, a little jacket to keep you warm, um, but you're not in the snow. And, uh, and just to reiterate, you know, I, I think it's so important that, you know, you, you find somebody, you know, to whom you can do this with. And, you know, whether it's a spouse, you know, or um, a partner, or a best friend, um, even if that best friend is a dog. And, um, and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, there's, there's a whole body of literature, you know, showing that if you exercise with your dog, you're more likely to meet recommended levels of physical activity. So I really do encourage that, and, and it's, it's not just from my own kind of personal um, observation and opinion, but um, evidence-based recommendation. So, you know, I think these are the, the questions that I, I hope we would, you know, continue to kind of um, ask and, and, and discuss this morning or this afternoon. You know, um, what are you guys doing, you know, to maintain your physical activity and fitness during the winter months? And, you know, how have you overcome barriers? I mean, that kind of peer learning, I think, is so important. I mean, we're all busy, um, but, you know, we work in a health sciences center, you know, so we care about health. And, um, and how are you successful in overcoming those barriers? And then finally, you know, what has made you most successful in maintaining physical activity you know, during the winter or just maintaining it in general? And, um, and, and I'd love for, for people to kind of share some of their experiences. You know, we've got a few minutes left before we all have to move on to our one o'clock appointments. Um, and, uh, but really would love to open it up and, and see what your thoughts are. Yes. So I will start um, with the fact that as wellness now participants, you can get um, either a fitness assessment or an exercise prescription. Well, they'll either sort of analyze weaknesses and strengths or give you a new exercise program that's tailor made to you um, for $30. And it counts for one of your wellness credits. So it could end up banking you $125 at the end of the year. Wow. So you actually could make money getting a new exercise routine. Um,
um, and then it's harder to get an appointment. If you're thinking about it, I really recommend doing it now while it's cold outside and not as many people are thinking about it. So a couple of other things too I'll just share while your thinking caps are on. You know, um, other things that uh, can help, you know, with the motivation um, around physical activity are physical activity trackers. And I do notice a few of you in the room have Fitbits on your wrist. Um, there's all sorts of different kinds of trackers. Um, you know, Fitbit, of course, is the Kleenex of fitness trackers. You know, they were first and foremost. And so, I mean, I guess everything's a Fitbit until it's not. Um, but there are also other trackers that you can download onto your phone. Um, I don't keep a tracker on my wrist, but I'm kind of curious sometimes when I'm hiking, you know, or running to see how many steps, how many miles, um, how long did it take me. And I have an app on my phone called um, the Moves app. And it's a free download. Um, if you're on an iPhone 5 or above, it's good. If you're on, I don't even know if people have iPhone 4s anymore, but it'll drain the battery in about six minutes. Um, but on anything above that, um, it does not drain my battery, and uh, I love it, you know, and I'm out hiking, and I was, I was doing something um, over the weekend, and I was so psyched when it said I had 15,414 steps. It was my past one-month record. It equated to 6.2 miles, and it took two hours and 44 minutes of walking. I thought that was amazing. I couldn't believe I walked that much. And I burned 443 calories. Not sure how accurate the calories are. But, um, but what I thought was interesting is, you know, it's, it's pretty good with steps. And I've compared it to, you know, the Apple Health Watch at the same time. And um, not mine, but I wore one of my friends. And, uh, and it, was, it was good. So, and there's actually an article in JAMA that um, looked at um, the Moves app and Fitbit wrist, Fitbit, the zip Fitbit, and um, I think the Nike Fuel Band, and compared them to an actograph, which is the gold standard of, of accelerometers, and they were, all, they were all pretty good. The Moves app did great. It was developed by the University of Pittsburgh as part, or no, University of Pennsylvania as part of their employee wellness program by a guy named David Ash, very smart. So um, I like the Moves app, it's good, you know, in terms of, you know, you manage what you measure. So that can be helpful. Other things too that I'll just kind of toss out there that are, you know, can be, you know, indoor alternatives, you know, to some of the things we talked about. And I know this sounds a little corny, but, you know, mall walking, you know, is uh, there's as part of the Surgeon General Step It Up campaign. Um, some of the people that were there were people who owned the Mall of America, you know, and they are a community partner of the Step It Up campaign and um, getting malls to stay open or to open earlier in the morning um, so that people can come in and do mall walking you know and the mall of america is a great place to do that you know it's really well located right off the freeway um, and uh, it's so damn cold there in the winter time you know you want to be inside so um, but mall walking is another one you just have to be careful to keep your credit card in the car you know before the stores open or <laughs> I'd walk more, but spend more too. <laughs> so, but does anybody else want to share kind of some successes or, or what they've done in order to be successful with physical activity? It's, um, it's you know, definitely something that uh, uh, is, is achievable and it's doable, you know, whether we're talking about wintertime. Um, you know, I think some, we have some similar barriers, you know, even in the summer when it's so incredibly hot here. And you don't want to necessarily be outdoors, you know, at the end of the day when, you know, the temperature is 100 degrees, uh, the ozone level is unacceptably high, you know. But, um, you know, and then our strategies change a little bit because we try and get people to exercise earlier in the morning, for example. But earlier in the morning in the wintertime just means it's colder and darker. And I, I didn't include the running with your headlamp on, which I do do, but um, you have to be very confident. <laughs> so, well, listen, I will leave it at that. I hope that... Um, uh, like I said, my goal was to improve your knowledge and change your attitudes and beliefs and hopefully influence your behaviors and uh, reduce some barriers for you to um, be active uh, and to activate you and to not 